The Vedas contain the most fundamental and advanced knowledge there is, though usually portrayed in the form of a paradox, an analogy, metaphor, or story, so that one has to crack the code in order to find the wealth hidden in them. That knowledge is not like modern empirical science, which is cumulative and provisional. Yet, it is somehow contained in the Vedas, even if in an embryonic or potential form. I aim to spark curiosity and inspire a spirit of learning among our viewers. By delving into these ancient texts, we can enrich the study and teaching of medicine and endocrinology. The vast writings of ancient Sanskrit and other Indian literature offer a fertile ground for such explorations, inviting us to build on the wisdom of the past to advance our understanding in the present for innovation in the future. In the ancient era spanning from 3500 BCE to 500 AD, the roots of assisted reproductive technology can be traced back to the traditions and practices of civilizations like the Indus Valley and Vedic societies. During this period, the tradition of Niyoga Prata was prevalent, allowing a widow or a childless woman to bear a child by another man, typically a relative of her deceased husband. The concept of artificial insemination was also familiar as indicated by Vedic literature. Sages would create so-called enchantment mixtures to aid childless queens in conceiving. These practices show that ancient societies were not only aware of assisted conception and gamete manipulation, but also applied these techniques in ways that parallel modern fertility treatments. One of the most compelling stories comes from the Mahabharat, specifically Adi Parva, chapter 114, shloka 17. It narrates the birth of the Kauravas, which offers an extraordinary parallel to modern in vitro fertilization techniques. Gandhari, the queen, endured an unnaturally long pregnancy of around 15 months. When she finally delivered, it was a hard lump of dead flesh. Devastated, she intended to discard it, but was stopped by sage Vyasa. He instructed her to cut the flesh into a hundred pieces and store them in jars filled with ghee. Over time, these pieces developed into 101 children. This ancient narrative strikingly resembles modern reproductive technologies, the splitting of a single embryo into multiple parts and incubating them in separate containers parallels the concept of in vitro fertilization, where eggs are fertilized in a lab and can result in multiple pregnancies. IVF is a technique used to help people with fertility problems. It involves removing an egg from a woman's ovaries, fertilizing it with sperm in a laboratory, and then returning the fertilized egg now an embryo, to the woman's womb to grow and develop. But Gandhari's story goes beyond modern-day IVF, suggesting the possibility of extra-uterine gestation, a concept that remains speculative but could represent a future frontier in reproductive technology. Growing a baby completely outside the womb is now called ectogenesis, These artificial wombs have been tested on lambs and they are fully grown for four weeks. They even develop a coat of fur and scientists have confirmed that they have all parts of the body fully developed without any issues. If law permits, then they can complete artificial wombs for humans. Did ancient Indians also do the same? Did they take the sperm and egg and not only fertilize them but also create these artificial wombs called kum to grow the embryo into fully developed babies? But how did that kum, the ancient artificial womb, really look like? In almost every ancient temple inside the main chamber or the womb chamber there will be a kum. Praveen Mohan explores one from an ancient temple at Hampi. He describes the kum as a very complex, sophisticated device. The bottom has a large oval chamber to hold the growing fetus. It has two handles or knobs attached to it on the left and right, perhaps for opening it if needed. It seems to be having two large tube-like structures attached on either side. He says what is more interesting is that the entire structure has a long cylinder attached on top, which seems to be a type of ventilation mechanism to supply oxygen. 
The story of Gandhari not only highlights the advanced knowledge of ancient Indian civilizations, but also opens up fascinating possibilities for the future of reproductive science. It reminds us that the quest for understanding and enhancing human reproduction is an age-old pursuit, bridging the ancient and modern worlds. Think plastic surgery is a modern luxury? Think again. The roots of cosmetic and reconstructive procedures go back more than 2,500 years. One of the most remarkable figures in ancient surgery is Sage Sushruta, often referred to as the father of surgery. His groundbreaking work, the Sushrut Samhita, was composed in the 6th century BCE and laid the foundation for many surgical techniques still in use today. For example, Sushruta introduced rhinoplasty, a nose surgery technique that even today's cosmetic surgeons would nod in approval of. In fact, even today this technique is known as the Indian flap. Sushut describes his method. He says, The portion of the nose to be covered should be first measured with a leaf, then a piece of skin of the required size should be dissected from the living skin of the cheek and turned back to cover the nose. If the nose is too short or too long, the middle of the flap should be divided and an endeavor made to enlarge or shorten it. The Sushrut Samhita contains 184 chapters with descriptions of 1,120 illnesses, 700 medicinal plants, 64 preparations from mineral sources, and 57 preparations based on animal sources. This encyclopedic work is a testament to the advanced medical knowledge of ancient India. Let's go through some examples demonstrating this. 9,000 year old dental practices. In the Mega region, evidence of early dental practices has been found. Flint tools were used to drill into decaying teeth, demonstrating early attempts at dental surgery. The survival of patients post operation indicates successful and effective treatments. In addition, evidence shows that trepanation, the practice of drilling holes into the skull, was performed. Possible reasons for this include alleviating brain pressure due to fluid buildup or removing parasites. The survival of patients post-operation is evidenced by signs of healing in the skulls. 5,000-year-old prosthetic eyes, a burial site near burnt city Iran close to Baluchistan, revealed a skeleton with a prosthetic eye showcasing early prosthetic practices. The Sushrut Samhita spread across the globe, starting with an Arabic translation in 800 AD, known as Kitab Shah Shun al-Hind. By the 19th century, it was translated into Latin by Hessler and into German by Müller, bringing worldwide recognition to Sushrut's contributions. However, over time, his name and the importance of his work began to fade. When delivery by nature fails, the line between life and death becomes thin. In these critical moments, ancient practitioners turned to extraordinary measures, performing C-sections centuries before modern science. The birth of Lord Krishna offers a fascinating glimpse into the early understanding and execution of surgical deliveries. These early surgical interventions, born of desperation and a profound knowledge, offer a glimpse into the struggles and triumphs of our ancestors. And what can their stories teach us about the enduring human quest to safeguard life? In an attempt to save infant Krishna from evil forces determined to prevent his birth, a young Brahmin named Sushruta, trained under the guidance of Rishi Bhardwaj and the Atharva Veda master Vamdeva, was called upon. Sushruta had spent years mastering Ayurvedic medicine and surgery, making him uniquely qualified for the daunting task ahead. Gangaracharya, another revered sage, led Sushruta into Devaki's chambers. After a careful examination, Sushruta informed Gangaracharya of the situation. He said, If we proceed to deliver the baby through normal means, it may take all night. Devaki is not in labor, and the pains will have to be induced. Sushruta proposed, We will have to take the baby out by Shalya Prayoga. 
This decision highlights the advanced surgical techniques available during that era and the critical role of surgical intervention in ensuring the safe delivery of infants in life-threatening situations. Sage Sushut, a founder of ancient Hindu medicine, documented the importance of performing post-mortem caesarean section in his medical treatise the Sushrut Samhita. This ancient text provides substantial evidence of early surgical practices in ancient India, Greece, Rome, forming the foundation for the modern C-section. The Garba Upanishad, another ancient text, offered detailed insights into fetal development, closely matching modern embryological understanding. This ancient knowledge was so advanced that it drew the attention of Western scholars. For instance, the Garba Upanishad was translated into German by Paul Dusen over 150 years ago. Ancient Indian carvings found in temples across the subcontinent offer a captivating glimpse into the remarkable technological advancements achieved by the civilization millennia ago. One striking example is a carving depicting the process of fertilization. A sperm approaches an ovum. Initially dismissed as mythological, closer examination reveals a startling level of accuracy and detail, challenging conventional narratives about ancient societies. These carvings also depict stages of cell division and fetal development, indicating a profound grasp of embryology. Further, other carvings illustrate advanced medical practices such as ultrasound examinations and caesarean sections. Modern science stops here, but our ancestors went a step further to develop artificial wombs. According to the World Health Organization, 15 million babies are born prematurely each year, of which 1 million die due to complications. The need to reduce neonatal mortality has accumulated in the development of artificial wombs and placenta technology which provides an environment for the ectogestation of the fetus. In Gandhari's case, the description mirrors an extrauterine gestation, a scientific feat that future researchers may be able to achieve. What's more, surrogacy and embryo transfer might seem like recent medical breakthroughs, but their roots trace back to ancient legends such as the remarkable birth story of Balaram. Balaram was an ancient Indian ruler of the Yadava dynasty, respected then and worshipped now as a Hindu deity. He was born as the elder brother of Lord Krishna and both of them existed during the Mahabharata era. Balaram was born under extraordinary circumstances. The tyrant king Kamsa, who ruled Mathura, was forewarned by prophecy that he would be slain by Devaki's eighth child. Driven by fear, Kansa mercilessly killed the first six children born to his cousin Devaki by smashing the newborns against stone floor. However, it is said, when the seventh child, Balaram, was conceived, divine intervention altered his fate. The Hindu legend recounts that Vishnu intervened and Balaram's embryo was miraculously transferred from Devaki's womb to the womb of Rohini, Vasudeva's first wife. This divine act is captured in the Hari Vamsha and the Bhagavata Purana. It states, the Bhagavan, as the self of everything, tells the creative power of his unified consciousness, Yoga Maya, about his plan for his own birth as Balarama and Krishna. He begins with Balaram. The whole of Shesha, which is my abode, will become an embryo in Devaki's womb, which you shall transplant to Rohini's womb. The ancient technique described in these texts bears a striking resemblance to modern medical practices known as embryo transfer and surrogacy. In the legend, the embryo transfer is carried out by Mahamaya, a cosmic force. Devaki conceived Balaram naturally, however, to protect the unborn child from Kansa, the embryo was transferred to Rohini's womb, ensuring its safety and continuity. This ancient narrative mirrors the modern practice of surrogacy, where an embryo created through in vitro fertilization is transferred to a surrogate mother's womb to ensure a safe pregnancy and delivery. In modern day practice, when the biological mother cannot carry the embryo due to health issues, a surrogate mother is selected. Her womb is hormonally prepared and the embryo is transferred at the optimal time to ensure successful implantation and development. The surrogate mother then carries the pregnancy to term, eventually delivering the baby, which is handed back to the biological parents.
This connection between ancient legends and modern medical practices just goes to show the timeless quest to protect and nurture new life, no matter the era. And finally, ending with the most mind-blowing technology yet, stem cell preservation. Modern science often feels cutting edge, but some ancient practices reveal a profound understanding of biotechnology, such as the preservation of stem cells in Hindu traditions. An intriguing artifact in Hindu culture is the Tayutu, which translates to cut from the mother. This remarkable item is a stem cell preservation vial worn around the waist of Hindu children. Stem cells collected from the umbilical cord blood are stored in this vial for future use. Unlike the modern chiropreservation process, which involves freezing, the Hindu method does not involve freezing. Instead, cells are preserved in a vial with a mysterious ingredient, now known only to select few doctors who practice this ancient science. This practice serves as a powerful reminder that current knowledge can be a rediscovery of past wisdom. The ancient method highlights the importance of preserving and building upon ancient knowledge to advance in various fields. The umbilical cord blood is a rich source of stem cells, considered as jiva, the essence of life, in Vedic texts. This tradition continues in modern day practices, emphasizing the timeless value of this biological resource. In many parts of India, the umbilical cord stump is traditionally dried and stored for future medicinal use. It is believed to treat various illnesses and infertility. Since Indian traditions are nothing but an excerpt of Vedic science, it points towards the possible emergence of dried stump as an easy and cost-effective means for stem cell preservation. Ancient Indian epics also describe early forms of assisted reproductive technology. For instance, the story of King Brihadratha's wife and her infertility treatment is an eye-opening tale. King Brihadratha, who faced infertility, was given a mango by the sage Koshik to share with his two queens. Each queen consumed half, resulting in the birth of half a child from each. These halves merged to form a living child, Jarasandha. This story suggests the administration of an oral agent to promote ovulation, similar to modern gynecological practices. In Charaka Samhita, the embryonic stromal cells are described to constitute a low, relatively undeveloped or less evolved level of energy. This description is actually really accurate as stem cells are undifferentiated cells that can change into various types of cells, almost any cell type in the body. Today, scientists are rediscovering the wisdom embedded in these ancient practices. Recent studies have shown that bone marrow derived stem cells combined with activated plasma can positively impact reproductive outcomes in patients with age related infertility. However, foreign invasions and suppression for centuries led to the loss of much of ancient literature and decline of traditional practices attributing to a great loss of ancient Vedic medicinal knowledge. But the real issue arises when we neglect these ancient scriptures, dismissing them as mere right-wing propaganda. This dismissal prevents us from uncovering potentially valuable knowledge. Thank you for watching, I hope you enjoyed this video. Namaste.